Welcome to Lighting the Educational Flame, created and produced by educator and author Mark Hoberman, owner and director of Grade Success Tutoring. Mark will be joined by Susan Brender, CEO and host of The Susan Brender Show. The purpose of this program is to offer our listeners a variety of stories dealing with many interesting topics surrounding education. It is our hope that students and parents alike will benefit from the wide range of topics, including study skills, test prep, anti-bullying, sports, music, and more. We hope you enjoy our show, Lighting the Educational Flame. Hello and welcome to the talk show, Lighting the Educational Flame, brought to you by Great Success Education. I am Mark Hobman and my co-host is Susan Brender. How are you doing today, Susan? I'm doing fine as always, and I'm so appreciative that we're going to be interviewing a wonderful man today who is so interesting that the audience is just going to absolutely flip. I wish I could be as interesting because I taught English for uh, 33 years, and this guy is a tremendous specialist and so accomplished in the field of science. And that and math totally escaped me. So I'm sure he's going to have some great things to say for us today. So uh, let's just bring him in. At Grade Success, it's our job to make sure that your child succeeds in school regardless of the subject or grade level. Our tutors are trained professionals who know how to promote learning and encourage results. Whether you are looking for help with SAT, ACT prep, private and group tutoring, K-3 through reading programs for your child, or educational consulting and college counseling, here at Great Success, we can help you find the right answer. Visit GradeSuccess.com to learn more about our in-person and online program options. Great Success, where your child's success is our business. Our guest today is science expert, Ken Savin. Ken, welcome to Lighting the Educational Flame. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. True pleasure. Ken, can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you became involved in science? Uh, well, I've always loved science. <laughs> um, uh, early on in my career, uh, I really became interested in chemistry. Even in high school, I thought it was uh, pretty interesting. I went to college and got a degree in chemistry and went on to get a PhD in chemistry and do a postdoc. And um, from there, I thought I would go into education, uh, you know, some maybe teach at a, a college or what have you, but ended up going to work in industry and teaching on the side. I actually was uh, and still am an adjunct professor at Butler University, and I taught actively for about 11 years and uh, worked my way through uh, work at a pharmaceutical company and then uh, retired. But um, uh, before I retired, I ended up uh, finding my way into my current role. Kind of an interesting uh, set of circumstances. Did some work with um, the uh, Center for the Advancement of Science and Space. And um, uh, when I retired, I ended up joining them and I work with them now. Was it always college or did you ever teach uh, any kind of public school, high school, something like that? No, no public school, um, high school um, have done some, uh, you know, uh, single day event type things and have been involved in the, the local, I live here in Indianapolis and the, the local uh, STEM education uh, big day event, which occurs in October. We have a, a big, um, uh, it's called um, uh, Indiana Science and um, it's, a, it's a big one-day event that we've been involved in through the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space. You know, Mark, I'm going to jump in for a second and ask Ken the, the following question. You know, Ken, years ago, I remember there used to be these science fairs. And at these science fairs, you, you, it was unbelievable the things that kids did, even little kids, uh, elementary school kids. And it kind of set them on a path. Um, because it was so exciting to make something that was very innovative. Now, do you see kids today or um, even high school kids or college kids doing amazing things um, and also being part of these science fairs? Yeah, so um, the science event here in Indiana, you, I'm just I am just shocked by what I see. What these young people are able to conceive and then what they're able to execute. It's really remarkable. I think it goes beyond um, access to modern digital tools, right? It's not just the fact that they have the internet. It's more than that. It's the way they think about things, the way they uh, process information and what, they, what their expectations are, I think have changed. 
for um, uh, w one of my summer interns. Uh, I, I try to have summer interns as part of my, my job. And a couple of years ago, Rachel, my summer intern, as a, I met her actually as a high school student. She uh, ran her first experiments on the International Space Station. She was a sophomore, had submitted them, and the first two launches that her experiments were put on actually blew up. So it wasn't until the third launch and um, she was a, by that point, a junior, almost senior in high school. And I met her at the launch and she and uh, uh, her mother and I had lunch and got to talk about things. It really just a remarkable way of thinking of things. And then um, uh, she went to uh, college, went to the University of Chicago and um, I hired her on as an intern. And just the way she uh, worked with us and what she was able to accomplish and how she thought about things, I just, I, I, I'll tell you, I was not thinking about those types of things when I was in high school, right? I, in my no stretch. So I'm really, it really makes, uh, for me, it's really exciting and exhilarating because it's a promise for the future. And for uh, my organization, we, we really do have a strong focus on STEM education and it's not just the um, young people, which I'll talk about in a moment. I'm sure you have some questions around that, but we also spend a lot of effort educating adults, right? People who from my generation, NASA was something that happened far away and you, every once in a while it would be, you know, Walter Cronkite would show it on the news right. and that was it. But what you've seen and what Rachel, my intern, taught me was that it is accessible now by everyone. In the United States, space has become democratized. It's something that we can all be a part of in some way. And it goes both ways. It's not only we can be a part of it, but it is starting to touch our daily lives in many ways, some that we know um, and some that we uh, may not understand yet, but it's there, the impact is there. Yeah. You know, Ken, some of the things that you've worked on are very interesting. And could you tell our viewers what you have done with freeze dry, um, drying samples of, of drugs to help patients? Yeah, so so um, there's a long standing set of projects that are coming out of the pharmaceutical industry all, all the way back into um, shuttle days. Right. So years ago. Um, and for Space Station, we continue that trend. Uh, one of the projects, and, and I'd say one of the areas that we really focus on from the pharmaceutical standpoint are on um, formulations, how, how pharmaceutical products are turned from a chemical entity into a product that we would go to the store or go to the pharmacist and purchase. And uh, one of the uh, things that we think about is the form, and that's the, um, uh, the physical thing, the physical entity that we have access to. And um, freeze drying is one of the ways that uh, pharmaceutical products are processed, especially large um, biological models. So large protein products can be freeze dried. Um, one example, it's not necessarily a pharmaceutical product, but for many years, plasma has been a freeze dried product. You can take it from a lot of people, um, freeze dry it, put it into a can, um, as a powder. And then when it gets to whoever needs it, you can um, sort of pop the can open, rehydrate it, and then use it, put it right into a person. Now there's problems with that that they figured out over time, but that's an example of a freeze dried product. Um, and uh, what the pharmaceutical company was trying to do in this case, um, when you freeze dry things, they tend to not be totally uniform. It's not like a perfect powder. It's um, some of it's crystalline, some of it's a powder. Um, and uh, we refer to that as non-uniformity. And that's a bad thing because you want every pill to be identical. You want the first yeah. pill you make and the last. And if the first pill had a lot of crystals and the last pill is mostly powder, they won't perform the same way in your body. So um, what this com and what they found was when they do this on big scale, it tends to look like a layered cake where there's layers of crystals and then powder in between and another layer of crystals. And that um, made the team believe that it was in fact um, an effect of gravity. The layering was an effect of gravity. So the way you freeze dry something is 
you, it comes in a solution of water, let's say, mm -hmm. and you freeze it. So it's a frozen block and then you apply vacuum to it and slowly the water goes directly from the solid phase to the gaseous phase. It never goes through the liquid phase. Mm -hmm. um, and the question was, does the layering occur when you freeze it or when you dry it? And once we know the answer to that, can we change something to make it work so that we can get either all crystals or all powder or what have you? So um, that was the study was, hey, if we remove gravity from part of the equation, what do we get? So what the team did was they got a big batch of the stuff. They f froze it and then dried it on the earth and showed that they got the layering. And then they took um, one part of it and they froze it and then they launched it into space and they dried it in space. And then they put some into space and they froze it and then dried it in space. And then the last batch they took into space, they froze it in space, dropped it out of orbit and then dried it on the ground. And um, the results from that study are still not done yet because uh, they had a problem when the uh, samples were being um, dried in space. So they were frozen and then a pump was applied uh, the pump uh, ended up failing on the space oh. station. So, and it turned to a liquid and they didn't know that until it was too late. So they're going to have to run that one again. And I think they're running it um, in the next couple of months. They're going to run that experiment again and kind of finish that up. But it's really a, an interesting use of space station. Yep. Yeah. Mark, I'm interested, you know, one of the things that he talked about is this young woman who uh, was at the science fair and very fascinating. Now, you were a teacher. And how many students or women, if you will, or girls, uh, we'll call them girls, were interested in, in engineering, were interested in science of any sort? Well, as Ken said, over the years, it changed drastically because I, uh, over a 33-year career, I, I wasn't so impressed with what I saw. And then there came a time where I couldn't believe what I was seeing and that it was kids I was seeing it from. My own son uh, was a computer science major and I, I brought him to computer camp at some point and I walked in and not to be sexist, I couldn't believe how many girls were there also. You know, I'm used to just the boys doing the science and it's just so advanced. And, you know, I one time made the mistake was say, saying, oh, you put, you created this game and how did you code it? And after the first, you know, 30 seconds, I wanted to stab myself in the head. I didn't know what he was talking about. But he was, when they talk about this, they are so passionate about what they do. So what I've seen, and uh, you know, the grants I've seen for these kind of science projects and project-based learning and things like that in the sciences is incredible. And there's two facets of incredible. There's, oh my God, what they're doing is incredible. And oh my God, it's incredible. And this kid is 14. So, so <laughs> It's just, it's unbelievable how, you know, the spectrum and, and how, how it's changed over the decades. But absolutely, I've been blown away my last five or seven years teaching with things that these people can do. And look at the experiments they do in colleges and when it comes to COVID and things like that. And it says, this came from, you know, the college. I know my, you know, my son wrote a paper on some things and, and, and worked on some projects that I would think that a 45-year-old scientist was working on, not a 19-year-old college student. Yeah, that's right. You know, um, Ken, what do teenagers have to understand about some of the new scientific um, breakthroughs? Because there are so many. I mean, if you look at what pharma is doing, it's amazing. But what do you think about the teenagers? So, um, so first of all, I think there's a piece of um, uh, teenager life where they are not um, patient people right there, and they expect results and they expect to get things done. They expect a really fast turnaround, right? That's the, the, maybe the curse of modern day internet access is the ability to get results and answers really quickly. And that's not necessarily how um, science works, especially for where space is right now, to get something flown, run and brought and the results returned, it's, it's gonna take years. But at the same time, the fact that they are impatient people is um, something that pushes all of us, right? Maybe we shouldn't be having to wait two years, maybe a year or six months, or if we plan it right, we can run an experiment, get the results, and then without having to, you know, have everything in space ready to go so you don't have to fly it again. So I think there's a piece of that that they are lending to us a way of, of thinking. At the same time, even though they are very, in many cases, very sophisticated, and like I said, Rachel was thinking well beyond what I was thinking when I was her age, um, 
they also bring that uh, naive look at science, right? That, hey, well, shouldn't it work like this? And um, that simple approach is something that is extremely valuable to us. It's the, you know, we're doing very fancy experiments, but maybe the real focus is just on how water behaves. And um, for experiments that we ran when I was still working in pharma, that was what I felt was the biggest impact to us, was that I would come home and talk to my kids about what I was doing, and um, they would say, well, don't, don't you know this? Don't you know that water should behave in this way? And I was thinking about that. You know, I remember when I was in high school and then early in taking freshman uh, chemistry, that the professor talked about that. But I haven't thought about that in 20 some odd years. And it was forcing me to go back to the very basic fundamental aspects of science. And these kids are coming with that. They, they don't have to remember it. They, it's fresh and, the, and it's being taught a different way. Um, so in that way, I think there's a lot of benefit to working with younger individuals, right? So, um, uh, that's another reason for me to have these interns. In fact, one of my sons, a, a friend of his who played on his soccer team, who is now uh, a sophomore at Purdue, he sent me a, a text through LinkedIn, hey, um, I want to do an internship. And I jump at the chance because he's going to teach me, right? He's going to be the one. And the other exciting piece of it is that um, I'm, I'm an old guy, right? I'm 50 something. And um, uh, and I'm going to serve out, I'm going to do my career and I'm going to, you know, go on for another decade or so. But these kids are going to be the ones that go to Mars, right? They're the ones who are going to lead that. And you can see it in them that not only do they have the um, benefit of all the years of research that I and others like me and people long before me have invested to make this happen, but they've already in some ways surpassed me and what they're going to be able to accomplish. So I know we're going to be successful, right? I'm, I'm going to be the old guy watching it on some view screen someday, but I'll, I'll see those people and I'll see, you know, the people that I worked with when they were young and when I was younger. That's the exciting part for me. That's great to be able to, to, to you can stay young through them. I mean, that, that's one yeah. of the best parts of teaching also. Can you tell us about some of the work you've done with regards to STEM research? So we have a number of different projects associated with um, STEM programs. So some of it is just pure outreach. Hey, here's what's happening in space and um, uh, getting them excited about what's happening in science um, around, you know, seeing what people are doing in space. There are um, programs that are focused specifically on very young people. So, you know, there's a lot of um, thought around when do you, when is the right time to engage a person, a young person. Um, and some of our programming is even to the point where we have astronauts read um, books that are focused on space for young people, for very young people. At the same time, we do have projects that are um, built so that people can say, well, this is how I would want to run my experiment. For example, we have projects where um, there are seeds that are on station and a um, uh, group of students will say, well, this is how we should try to grow those seeds. And all it takes is for an astronaut to pull some seeds out, put them into the right medium, follow the directions that um, based on the experiment, and then grow them and get a result back. And that can be done in a very short period of time. Um, there are also projects like the one that um, uh, Rachel was part of where high school students can submit um, experiments that are actually then developed and run. And um, there's a number of organizations that we work with that um, then in turn are working with high school students to develop experiments. They bring them through a process to us and they get launched and, and run. So it's the whole gamut from um, a very early uh, sort of a less interactive things, but you know, you're reading and you're learning about it all the way to things where you're designing experiments and um, actually doing things that get done, brought back down and then interpreted. That's excellent. That, that totally runs the gamut. But speaking about running the gamut, I know you've done some experiments back uh, uh, years ago with NASA. And could you tell uh, our viewers a little bit about your work that you did with NASA? So 
so um, the work that I did um, was with NASA. So, you know, of course, um, you've got the space station, which is um, um, part of a NASA program, right? And the astronauts are NASA employees, right? They're government employees. Um, but the work I did, um, the people I was approached by was this weird organization called the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. And they are tasked with uh, um, operating the International Space Station National Lab, which was designated, at, um, Congress designated half of the U.S. portion of the uh, International Space Station to be a U.S. national lab, kind of like Los Alamos or, um, uh, you know, uh, Argonne, these U big U.S. national labs. And by doing that, what they did was they essentially said it is for the benefit of people um, on Earth, the, the U.S. citizen. So that is, um, those people uh, contacted me uh, when I was still working in uh, pharmaceutical industry and asked me if I wanted to do work in space. And they were really trying to develop a more commercial effort, um, get into industry more than what they had been doing in the past, which was really focused on um, more pure fundamental academic research. So um, uh, I put together a team of five, uh, five different uh, groups to do five separate experiments and we ended up running those. Like I said, um, uh, uh, they were uh, very different. Some were focused on um, a advanced product that was already in clinical trials. Um, some were on very fundamental research around um, uh, how formulations can be developed and how things dissolve in water, um, especially when they float. If you mix Ovaltine and milk, uh, Ovaltine will float on the surface and it has to be kind of stirred in. But in space, uh, things don't behave that way. There is um, something that's lighter. It doesn't necessarily float on top. So we wanted to understand how that um, was affected. And we did um, a couple of crystal growing experiments. So um, the whole principle behind many drugs is that the pharmaceutical agent, the drug, is like a key and it's fitting into a protein, which is kind of the lock. If it fits in right, it can block its behavior, block its ability to perform properly or get it to perform better than it did before. And, um, uh, but to understand the structure of the lock, that protein, uh, it's, it's a tough thing to do. It's really hard to understand it. And the way that the pharmaceutical industry and uh, uh, much of science understands it is through getting crystals. You can get a crystal of that protein and then shine an x-ray beam at it. And based on the diffraction pattern and some math and a good computer, you can sort of trace back all the atoms in the crystal and understand the structure of the individual protein molecule. And uh, we ran a couple of experiments doing that. One, purely just can we get that crystal of that protein? And another, we actually took the um, protein, crystallized it, and then try, and then we uh, put in a solution of the drug to see how it would fit in and get a crystal of the um, combined uh, lock and key together to give us an even better picture. Um, so there were some really interesting um, projects. In fact, the one we did, the drug that was um, in clinical trials at the time, uh, this investigational product was on, um, it allowed people to build muscle mass without having to work out. Oh, I want that. I want that one. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great Send that one. over. Not it's, my thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's based on a, um, a natural occurrence it happens in some uh, animals where uh, mammals, where um, a certain protein, a regulator fails. And when that happens, those animals become really super strong. They look like the Arnold Schwarzenegger wow. of the animal world. And so what we did was we actually developed um, a monoclonal antibody that would block that protein from operating properly in a normal person. And thus you would gain muscle mass. And it's not for people to go um, become Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Um, but it's for people who have um, muscle wasting diseases that might be uh, that might benefit from being able to build more muscle mass, and of course for astronauts who are um, losing strength and muscle mass uh, through uh, lack of use, right? They begin to atrophy. It was also of interest. 
Has uh, it been used to anybody outside the uh, space world, so to speak? Have they put that? Yeah, they've, they, that, those, yeah, there's several examples of that product that have been in clinical trials and they do work. Yes. Can I, I'm interested in understanding um, what is going to happen when people like Elon Musk go up to Mars. Are you going to be involved in any way with that kind of um, travel? I mean, we're talking about maybe taking them two years to get up to Mars, but Mars, that's amazing. And, you know, what do you think about that a little bit? Tell us. So, okay, so, so first we'll, we'll back off and kind of see where we are. So where we're at right now is... Um, uh, NASA is trying to understand what it's going to take to um, to survive a long duration mission like that, like going to the moon, right? So even going to the moon and staying there for a period of time is a, potentially a hazardous um, adventure. And and then when you talk about going to Mars, which is many many times further, um, there's a lot of challenges there. Some of which we're trying to address. Some of which we have been unable to address. Mm -hmm. But the space having the um, access to the International Space Station makes um, testing all of your um, tools that will get you there much easier and much more important um, for us right now is the focus on that. So I'm not so, although I'm interested in going, you know, what's going to happen to going to Mars. What really interests me now is the tech development that is occurring that will get us to that point someday that will, that, that, um, that we can participate in now. One small example is the toilet system on the space station, right? So we, you know, think about it. It's one thing to think about all the waste, but another is um, the amount of water it takes, the amount of water it takes to, for a human to survive over time. And um, the system, if they just launched water up every year and didn't recycle any of the water, it would cost about um, uh, a quarter of a billion dollars just to ship water, just water. So the, um, they built a system that recycles water and it's it's pretty efficient. It's about 85% efficient. They have to get to better than 95% in order to make a mission to Mars viable. But one of the things they learned was they built this unit and they tested it on the ground for many, many months and it worked perfectly. They put it on space station and it failed within about a month and a half. Mm. And the difference, we think of it as um, an isolated, piece of equipment, but it's part of a system. The other part of the system it's hooked up to is the human. And it turns out that um, humans lose so much calcium from their bones because they're atrophying. Well, it ends up in their urine. It ended up in the, ur in the urine recovery system and it clogged it. And that's something that had to be, so you don't want to figure that out when you're on the way to Mars, <laughs> way too late. So the space station allows us to test these things, but more important to us is that that technology is something that could someday be built into, let's say a home here on earth where water becomes a bigger and bigger issue. You could recycle your own water and do it efficiently. Maybe someday it's um, an option when you go to you know, some home improvement store and you can buy a special type of toilet system that gets put in your house and the amount of water you use is decreased by, you know, 80%. It would be, a, you know, a breakthrough. And we're starting to see technologies like that, you know, even, you know, we've seen them for years, but that's just one example of one that I think someday will benefit people on earth. That's the anyway, people, people have to have, you, know, you have to have a lot of foresight to, to, to see these problems. No one, you, know, you get a problem when you're driving and, oh, look, I shouldn't have bought this car or this, this fan belt should have been replaced sooner. But that's different when you're in space and you look at something and, oh, look, the, the water system isn't working right. So you know, pe people got to think ahead about that. Uh, Ken, where can people learn more about you and the things that you do? Um, so they can um, go to our website. You can look up the uh, International Space Station National Lab okay. or look up uh, Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. Both will take you to the same website. You can see um, all the types of programs that we have uh, going. Um, and you can see some of our, uh, you know, um, past projects. Um, but you can also see how to connect with us if you'd like to do your own research or, or have a, a connection with us. And uh, there's also uh, STEM education materials. 
Um, and for the STEM education materials, you can look at what we've got there and download some of the material, or you can talk to one of our STEM educators and, and see what type of programming might um, be best suited to what you're trying to accomplish. Gotcha. Excellent information for our viewers. Uh, Ken, Susan, and I can't thank you enough for joining us today and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you being here. And uh, to the viewers, remember to reach out to us on social media. Look for great success on Facebook and Twitter. And we would love to hear from you. You can also find me, Mark Hoberman, on LinkedIn. Again, thanks to Ken Savin for being with us today. Susan, as always, thank you. And viewers, don't forget to tune in to our sh next show. This is Mark Hoberman thanking you for watching Lighting the Educational Flame on the Great Success Education Channel. Have a great day. Thanks so much, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, thanks Susan. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Lighting the Educational Flame with Mark Hoberman. To contact Mark, email him at info at gradesuccess.com.